Please join me in the call and response for our call to worship this morning. When we stand at the edge of fear and worry, God invites us to step into the water of faith and trust. When we stand at the edge of the world's pain and need, Jesus invites us to step into the land of humble service. When we stand at the edge of our hunger and thirst, Spirit invites us to sit at the table of grace. Amen. Please stand, remain standing, and as we sing hymn number 66, praise my soul, the King of heaven. cite the Apostles' Creed, our affirmation of faith. I believe in God the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come, judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. may be seated. We're going to move into a time of prayer this morning. I want to lift up um, some prayer requests we have in the life of the church. Uh, for Johnny Ferguson, recovering from, frac from 
the fractured shoulder after a fall. Um, Doris O'Kelly is under hospice care at the Memphis Jewish home. Uh, Ron and Jeanette Wolf, um, Jeanette Wolf passed away on May 19th and they had her service over the weekend. Uh, Missy Smith, the continued prayers for Missy after her surgery on her right leg and foot. Uh, Susan Batson and John and Joanne Davis. And please um, keep the family of Amanda Gross, wife of Gerald, and daughter-in-law of Jim and Jane in your prayers uh, for comfort and strength as she continues uh, to fight for her life. Do any prayers or joys or concerns you have uh, today. Oh, sorry. Cool. Prayers for that. Uvalde, Texas. And that community and those parents. That one hit a little different. Anybody else? Please join me in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day and bringing us together in your sanctuary where we can worship you as one body. Lord, you're wonderful, merciful, and all loving and full of grace, and we will never be able to comprehend just how loving and wonderful you are, but we are grateful. Almighty God, we confess that we fall short every single day in our efforts to be the hands and feet of your Son. And we ask for your forgiveness as we seek discernment and do our best to serve you in this fallen world. Lord, we thank you for the gifts you give us, the communities we are a part of, the friends and family we have on this earth, and for the love we get to experience. Lord, we pray for those in the community of Uvalde, Texas, Laguna Woods, California, and Buffalo, New York. Hold these communities in your arms as they heal from the tragedies they have experienced in the last two weeks. Let your son be present in the lives of the families and members of the communities. And Lord, as families heal in our own body, our own church, and our own communities, God, we ask you to continue to heal and to comfort and to bring your grace and love into their lives. We thank you for your son and the sacrifice he made and the prayer he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture this morning is from the Old Testament account of Joshua, chapter 2. We'll be reading verses 1 through 14. If you want to follow along in your Bible, I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came to the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and lodged there. And it was told to the king of Jericho, Behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you and who entered your house. For they have come to search out all the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, True, the men came to me, but I did not know where they, came, where they were from. And when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. 
I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hid them under the stalks of flask that she had laid in order on the roof. So the men pursued after them on the way to the Jordan as far as the fords, and the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. Before the men lay down, she came up on the roof and said to the men, I know the Lord has given you the land, and the fear of you has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as, and as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and the earth beneath. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that I have, as, I, as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. And the men said to her, Our life for yours, even to death. If you do not tell this business of ours, when, when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Children, please come forth. Good morning, everybody. How are you? I have to look way down there to say hey to Frank and Asa. Good morning. So, Mr. Jeff just read to us from the book of Joshua. And when I saw that that's what the passage was for today, it really makes me think about some important things about the person who Joshua was. If you didn't know... Joshua was a leader, and he was a leader of a group of people who were called the Israelites. They had lived in the desert for 40 years. And when that 40 years was finished, God promised that he was going to give them a new country to live in. And so he told them, he gave them the orders. He said, march just march and you will make it to your new country. Now, they didn't know that there was going to be some trouble that they come across. And I'm going to tell you more about that when we're in Sunday school this morning. We're going to do some marching. I'll tell you that much. But when they, when they came to this place and they, there was something in front of them that they just didn't expect, God gave some pretty strange instructions to Joshua. And he was very obedient, and he obeyed, and he did exactly what God told him to do to help all these people that he just brought out of the desert. So it's really nice when we have instructions and we're told to obey. Sometimes it's easy to obey, and be obedient, and sometimes it's really hard, and you might think, why do I have to do this? But as you learn more about what Joshua did for these Israelites, for this group of people, you're going to see how good it turned into when he was faithful and obedient and followed God's instructions, and something good came out of it, even though it was pretty hard on the front end of it. So just remember that. You may have things that come up in your life, and it's hard. And God's going to tell you, obey me, or your mom and dad. They tell you to obey, right? Sometimes, Maddie? Yeah? <laughs> and it might be easy to obey mom and dad, but sometimes it's hard. But if you do the right thing, what's going to happen, Frank? Frank? 
I put you on the spot. I'm sorry. But if you do the right thing, what ha usually what happens? You can grow and learn from it, can't you? And you make it through whatever it is. All right. I'll remember that. And like I said, when we get to Sunday school, we're going to see what happened when those Israelites reached Jericho. So hopefully you have on your marching shoes today. We're going to see. All right. Let's say our prayer. Dear God, I'm so glad that you give us instructions on how to live our life. Help us to learn and obey and do what you say and know that we are always going to have our ears open and follow as you tell us. In your name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Mandy. We're going to move into a time of prayer um, in observance of Memorial Day tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow at 3 p.m. Wally, Wally, Wally. 3 p.m. 3 o'clock p.m. Uh, Wally Wiki will be uh, playing his taps at the bell tower in observance of Memorial Day. So, um, so if you wanted to come by and hear that, please do. Uh, this time, we have a responsive prayer in the bulletin, and then we'll follow with a moment of silent prayer. Let us give thanks to God for the land of our birth, who, with all its chartered liberties, for all the wonder of our country's story. We give thanks to God. For leaders in nation and state, and for those who in, past, in days past and in these present times have labored for the commonwealth. We give you thanks, O oh God. For those who in all times and places have been true and brave, and in the world's common ways have lived upright lives and ministered to their fellows, we give you thanks, O oh God. For those who serve the country in its hour of need, and especially for those who gave even their lives in that service, we give you thanks, O oh God. Please bow your head for a moment of silent prayer. Amen. As, as the ushers come forward with, for offering, please join me in a time of prayer for our gifts. Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the gifts that you, um, we give for you today, God. Please help us use them to glorify you, to honor you, and to honor our community, and to give back. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
So when people were asking me last week and the week before what I was preaching on this week, I casually just joked and said, probably what I write my Old Testament paper on next week. Kill two birds with one stone, write one exegesis paper and be done. And on Monday, this past Monday, as I sat in my office and consulted the lectionary, consulted the daily office, consulted the Book of Common Prayer and every other church liturgy slash church calendar resource I could think of, the only thing I kept thinking about was that paper that I wrote. I stressed so much about it and, and, and really just it kept me up at night, and that's all I could still think about even today. So what started as a joke a couple weeks ago has turned into reality quickly on Monday. And so, but what, what's cool though is I really, really loved what I wrote my paper on and I found it really cool and I found it really important as we see our different relationships with God and people and as we interact with the Old Testament, especially as we interact with the book of Joshua. So, I wrote my paper on a Hebrew word, believe it or not, and it's the Hebrew word harem. Harem is a key Hebrew word in understanding a lot of what goes on in the book of Joshua, especially in the first 12 chapters. I believe I have um, a graphic of the word if it's available. That is what harem looks like from right, your right, to your left. But the Hebrew word used around 32 times, 24 times in the first 12 chapters of Joshua, harem is something devoted to God, devoted to the ban in which God sets, something or someone devoted to utter destruction. Jericho and all its inhabitants were under the ban. They were devoted to for utter destruction. The entire land of Canaan was devoted to the ban. They were harem. And of course, we have the objects uh, that, were, that would be discovered of gold and silver vessels and bronze and iron. They were also harem, but they were devoted to God and set apart for sacred uses, as we will read in a couple of minutes. When I think of harem, I think of all those times when I was a kid and my mother went on a rage clean and everything was devoted to the ban. Everything was going to be thrown away if you don't pick it up right now. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. You still do it. Say you haven't cleaned your room or picked up your stuff. She's tired of it and she's going to throw it all away. It's all harem. It's all devoted to utter destruction. It happened to me a lot growing up. And now, guess who devotes a lot of things to the harem at home? I may begin using that word to teach my kids Hebrew while also saying when I bring out the Hebrew, daddy's serious. But it's key. A harem is a key word in understanding the conquest of Canaan. It's a key word in understanding Jericho. And before they invade Jericho, they have crossed the Jordan. They are doing their march around Jericho. And Joshua specifically tells them what the Lord has said in Joshua chapter 6. He says, And the city and all that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. Only Rahab, the prostitute, and all who are with her in her house shall live, because she hid the messengers whom we sent. But you... Keep yourselves from the things devoted to destruction, lest when you have devoted them, you take any of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel a thing for destruction and bring trouble upon it. But all silver and gold and every vessel of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. So what, what Joshua is saying, what God has said is that if you bring any of this harem back into the camp of Israel, you are bringing destruction upon your community, and you are turning Israel into harem itself. You are turning Israel into the ban. What's interesting about the conquest of Jericho is this is something that 
we have probably just glossed over so many times in our reading of Joshua's um, in Sunday school and whatnot. The conquest of Jericho is bookended by two cases of harem. In both cases, harem comes into Israel. Rahab, she's harem, she's devoted to destruction as a Canaanite, is one bookend on this end. Then we have the conquest. And then in chapter 7, we have Achan and his family. Achan is the quintessential Israelite. He is a member of the tribe of Judah. He's a warrior. Well, Achan brings harem into the camp of Israel after the conquest of Jericho, buries it into, under his tent, and eventually leading to their destruction as harem. I'm not going to go into the details. It's pretty gruesome. It's in chapter 7. Achan's disobedience of God and the harem contrasts Rahab being her harem herself and her confession and obedience of God. Rahab, I think most of us are pretty familiar with her story. Uh, She is identified as a prostitute in Jericho. But a closer look at the text in the, in, the, in the ancient language and the syntax of the, the, the sentence and the phrasing around her name, this is probably Rahab's business. She's not just some ordinary prostitute. She is probably the madam of this business. She's smart. She knows what's going on in her city and with the people and what they are thinking. She kn- the king knows her. She knows the king. Now, I'm sure a regular worker of this brothel, if you will, wouldn't have all this info about her city or about the people and how they feel. A regular prostitute would not be addressed by the king or summoned by the king, if, for that matter. And they probably wouldn't have access to the entire house like the roof. And she hides the two Israelite spies to protect them from the king's men as they come searching for them. She lies to her king and betrays her country and helps the spies. And in return, they help her. There's not a single barrier from either side here. Very easily, the, the spies could have just said, what, what, what care do they have that she helped them? Good, she helped them. Now they're safe. They can go back to camp. But there's no barrier for her either. She's not scared. She's confident. The boundary between Israel and Canaan at this point with Rahab is not drawn along ethnic or racial or political, gender or sexual lines, but in terms of allegiance to the Lord. Funny enough, throughout church history, Those have been the boundaries of our church, of the church. And it still continues to draw those boundaries today. Far too often, just as we have throughout history, we have devoted people to the ban. We have devoted people, things, people, groups, organizations to the ban. We have devoted them to utter destruction we don't listen to them. We don't let them be heard. We, don't, we just know that we are right, they are wrong, and we're just going to keep cherry-picking Scripture and throwing it in their face to prove our point. Our churches cannot even stay united over any of these lines. We're not much of a united Methodist church these days. How do we act towards those different than us? How do we act towards someone deemed harem, devoted to the ban, devoted to utter destruction? How do we act towards those people? What do we do when they begin talking about God or when they begin quoting scripture, when they begin telling you about their faith? We shut them down or shut them out? Notice what the spies did not do to Rahab when she makes her profession of God, when she makes her statement about God. 
They don't tell her she was wrong. They don't tell her she doesn't know what she's talking about, tell her she's not allowed to talk like that or tell her that God hates her. No, they said, you know what they said? They said, our lives were yours. See, they understand that God has come before them. And this is real. They don't even bring God up. They don't have to because Rahab already did it. So I really want to focus today on Rahab's confession and her declaration of who God is in verses 8 through 14. Uh, Verses 1 through 7 really give us a picture of who Rahab is as a respected woman, businesswoman with political awareness and courage. It also has these two Hebrew men and a brothel. Why go to a brothel? Well, as they probably told their wives, this is where you're going to go to learn about the men of the, of the city. This is where you're going to go to learn about the soldiers of the city, what's going on in the city. The king's men were there. The king could have been there. And the king knows all about it. They were there to learn. And that's just what they did. They learned from Rahab exactly what this city was feeling. And they were probably there as customers as well, because that was the culture. But here they are on the roof, about to go to sleep under this flax that Rahab had laid up there. And here comes Rahab, and this is the first time the reader gets to learn what is actually going through the minds of the Canaanites, including Rahab. The reputation of Israel and what has happened at the hands of their God has made it through the land since the Exodus. Rahab says, I know that the Lord has given you the land. I know. Her statement suggests absolute certainty. The fall of Canaan is inevitable. And she is absolutely certain because they have all heard how the inhabitants of the land melt away before them. And now they are next. And the fear has fallen upon them. Rahab does not say, I know that your God She doesn't say anything about your God or their God. She says, I know that Yahweh. Notice in your Bible, Lord is in all caps. That is the the personal name of God when it's in all caps. That is translated as Yahweh. She knows Israel's God by name and knows what he has done for his people. And now she knows and is certain what he is about to do to Jericho and the rest of the land of Canaan. Her words would have shocked the spies just as much as it would have shocked the ancient reader, and it it should shock us. It's at this point that it looks like Rahab is more confident in the fall of Jericho and the conquest of Canaan than Joshua and his army are and the rest of Israel. Now, of course, this, the, there's nothing that clarifies if this is a genuine uh, confession or spiritual conversion, uh, but she is assimilated into the people of Israel, and her identification of God by name and personal friend, genuine conversion seems favorable. There's provenient grace here, as we will look at in a second. Because Rahab shows her awareness of Israel's history in identifying the events from the exodus from Egypt, crossing the Red Sea, and what they did to the two kings of the Amorites. These are not current events. These aren't things that happened last week. These are things that happened 40 years ago, 35 years ago. And they have been waiting for 40 years for utter destruction. And it's finally come. And as Rahab has made it clear, this, this is inevitable. And the fear of this finally happening is falling over the land of Canaan. And the people are in utter despair. They have no courage. They have no spirit to resist the inevitable. They've had plenty of time to turn to God in these 40 years since hearing about what he has done in Egypt. But they have it. And they still are not. They still have the opportunity. It's probably too late now, 
but one person has. And she says, For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and the earth beneath. Rahab's statement is remarkable, especially for a foreigner in a polytheistic nation. We know from Scripture that the Canaanites worship multiple gods. That is polytheism. Rahab affirmed that Israel's God, Yahweh, has dominion over the realms of the heavens and the earth. Okay, these are the realms of many of the pagan gods that we read about in Scripture. And in this statement, she says, The Lord, your God, he is God. She is affirming and stating that God is the one true God. She is saying that all the gods they worship in Canaan are not gods at all. They're not true gods at all. All she knows about Yahweh is about what she has heard about him and the people, and this is enough for her to take that step of faith and make a genuine profession of faith. God's action on behalf of his people has convinced her, and she has changed her life and belief system and her entire world view because of what she has heard. So, in return, Rahab seeks amnesty, like you would. Rahab asks the spies to take an oath of protection for her and her father's household. Some argue right here that Israel's interaction with Rahab was a violation of God's commands. In Deuteronomy, God gives ex explicit instructions about not entering into any treaties with the Canaanites, but to devote them to the ban, to destruction, to harem. Rahab was to be, was to be devoted to, the, to destruction. And now she has guaranteed her safety for her, her and her family. And what is important here, Israel has not violated any of these commands from Deuteronomy because Rahab is affirming Yahweh. Rahab has received God's grace and his sovereignty, making her confession and in return asking Israel and Yahweh for amnesty. She is including God, the Lord, as the witness of the promise attached to this oath she is making with the spies. And if the person making the oath should go back on their promise, the Lord would judge that, that person or that group for breaking that promise. But what does it matter to the spies? They can go back. They can still devote her to destruction. It doesn't matter. Well, it was her persuasive language showing kindness, as she said. Her kindness is sparing their lives. In sparing their lives obligates them to reciprocate with equivalent kindness in the sparing of her and her family's lives. Typically, these, these kinds of oaths and these types of promises refer to acts of loyalty and carrying out faithfully the pledge of an agreement. And that is what the, the, the spies see. They see this loyalty from Rahab. So the spies' response comes as a shock. They see this loyalty, and so the, the, the spies feel they must reciprocate the same loyalty. Rahab has high respect for Yahweh, but is it something the spies can wave off to get around God's command of harem for her? They seem to readily accept the proposal, even putting their own lives on the line if Rahab and her family are harmed. And they only make one condition. If you betray, if you betray us and you tell what we're doing, the deal's off. That's fair. In the spy's affirmation of her oath, they echo the same words back of kindly, kindly and faithfully. They reciprocate the loyalty, and with her commitment to loyalty, it is clear as the spies felt the same way. We know this loyalty is carried out because after the fall of Jericho, Rahab and her family are spared, assimilated into the people of Israel, where she lived for the remainder of her life, according to Joshua to this day. 
and even a part of the lineage of Jesus. Does anybody know who she mothered? Boaz. Trivia for you. It's in the Bible. (laughs) So what do we do with this? God, in this interaction of Rahab and the spies and and the Israel, God is delivering his people and the foreigner alike. God knows something the spies don't because he has come ahead of them. He has come ahead of Israel. He has warned the people of Canaan what is coming so that she could know, so that she could rescue the spies, so that her and her family could be saved, so that the lineage of Jesus could still occur. That's provenient grace, folks. That is grace coming ahead that God has always promised. He sees the faith and profession of Rahab, one devoted to the ban, and brings her into his fold as if she is one of them. She's everything the Canaanites represented that God wanted destroyed. My professor said she represented idolatry and whoring after idolatry. With the language surrounding her name in Scripture, that is, the, that is what the author is trying to portray. She was everything that God wanted destroyed. The good news of genuine faith in the Lord can clearly save you from destruction. Even if you are a quintessential Canaanite, or in today's language we'll say uh, someone that represents everything God and the church stand against. I believe that those devoted to the ban or those who have been classified as banned that have a genuine faith in the Lord, that know his name, profess his greatness, they are a part of us too. I believe the boundary between Jesus and us is not drawn along these boundaries of ethnicity, race, politics, sexuality, gender lines, but in terms of allegiance and love for him. The Lord can deliver anyone and bring them into his people regardless of any boundary. And Rahab and her family were devoted to utter destruction. They were to die. But they are saved and brought into Israel where they are to this day as part of our Savior's lineage. At one point in your life, you may have been a quintessential Canaanite. I know I was, yet here we are today. Why? Because our Savior brought us into his family, and we are here to this day. Is all that stuff from our past still with us? It always will be because it's part of who we are and how we came to Jesus. It is our story, and I believe that Jesus is the uniting point of all of our stories As things progress in our church over the next couple of years, you have to decide where you are going to draw your boundary. Is it a line drawn around politics, gender, ethnicity, race, sexuality, or is it going to be a boundary drawn along Jesus? Because Jesus is and should be the uniting point for all of us. Not where you stand on this issue or that issue or feel about this or that. It's Jesus. Because he is the Lord of everything. The heavens, the earth, and everything in between. Nothing is greater or impossible with him. Yet we forget this when it comes to dealing with someone different than us. And rather than judging right out of the gate and throwing out meaningless scripture, maybe we should listen just like our spies, because it's not up to us to determine if someone's faith is real. That's already been done. Our job is to listen. Our job is to let God do his job. 
That's not our job. We're all welcome to the table when Jesus is the uniting point of our story and who we are. Let's pray. Father God, we, we ask you to come into this world and intervene in our hearts every single day as we arise and as we go out into this world, this broken world. We are broken, and so is everything around us, but God, we, we have the opportunity and the life to be the hands and feet of your Son, and we need to go out and be those hands and feet. Lord, we thank you for your love for all people, your love for us and where we're going. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Our hymn of invitation this morning is hymn number 369, Blessed Assurance. If you are looking for a new church home and want to join us at Covenant, we would be glad to have you. And please come forward during this song if that is you. Uh, please stand for Blessed Assurance. Let your story be that, that Jesus is the uniting point for you and everybody around you. And may the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storms. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. And may he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Amen. <laughs>